techniques or dives deeper into uh, orchestration and finally we conclude with uh, Uwe who is giving a hands-on on Open Tosca, how to model topologies, how to deploy them and then we focus on patterns in a strange application area and costumes that is given by Hannah. And then we will have a cloud talk given by Catalgo on content management in the cloud. And this then concludes the day. So, I could comment a lot of uh, Bluemix, really e-server, there's a complete mess up and mixture of what a component is versus what an application is, what software engineering, we need a lot of software engineering in the cloud and so on. So I don't believe the software engineering is over. So there's a lot of confusion and I could completely change my talk and uh, giving you an overview of applications, JDE server versus Bluemix and so on. Uh, but I don't do that because uh, I want to focus on cloud orchestration. So the structure of the next 45 minutes is I'm going to motivate why we need something that's called topologies in the cloud. Then I give you a quick overview on Tosca because we gave a talk I think last year on Tosca. Some of you will participate in the courses for the lecture on, on Tosca. Um, and then I will discuss something that's called declarative versus imperative processing of topologies. There's a lot of fight going on even within the industry. Which one is better? What are the limits? And so on. And then I discuss this new thing that Gerd already mentioned, the simple profile in Tosca, and give a quick overview of uh, on orchestration engines architecture from a high level, uh, so that Uwe can build on that and then discuss open Tosca. So, need for topologies. The need for topologies, this is a sample application that you see, and again, it's not an application in the sense of uh, a JDE application that you have UML diagrams, and the components are not classes, they are completely different, uh, different in the cloud world. The application consists of a building block, blocks of the middleware and so on that you need in order to somehow deploy a manager application. It's not the account build component, not the person build component. And if you orchestrate the account together with the person, it's a workflow This is different in this world, right? So the application consists out of, of course, the graphic user interface. You have a bunch of servlets that are running on a web server that are handling the graphical end user requests. And here you basically split. The web server can basically uh, route requests uh, to what I call here, uh, what I call here some account management. You have an EJB running in the JEE server that accesses an account database. You have some marketing campaign uh, logic that these are, for example, .NET Next assemblies that are running .NET application server. It goes against the content management system and some other stuff. So this is an application that you would like to bring to the cloud. Yeah, so which is what is called in this week now bursting. You burst them out into the cloud. So, what many people still do is, because they don't understand what cloud computing is, they package everything into a single VM, and then they upload it and then they say, Dear CIO, I'm a smart guy, I'm now doing cloud computing, give me a salary increase of 500 bucks. Right? So, it's a very naive approach. So, the application is in the cloud, and now the customers are starting using the application, and they like it more and more and more, and SLOs are suffering. So you need to scale. What do you do next? DSCIO, oh, I'm very smart. What I do is I create a second uh, VM, I upload it, and now I scale it. So, and then the customers are happy because we now spread the request across two different virtual machines. And, uh, but are you happy? Are you happy because you got the 500 bucks? But the CIO is not happy because at the sudden you have to pay license fees, for example, twice. Yeah? Because uh, you have uh, your Oracle or your DB2 in this VM as well as in this VM, so you need to pay the license fees, for example, twice. And you are even not happy because, look, take a look at the storage. In VMs, storage are typically VM scoped. That means the storage is not shared. That means the people who are using this VM uh, update the data here, people who are using this VM update the data here, data is running out of sync. Terrible. Yeah, we have a data integrity problem. But this is, uh, and then the CIO all of a sudden starts to think about, uh, hmm, are the 500 bucks uh, spent very well? Ben, do you have a question? Uh, uh, this is a good point. I guess it's even worse when you want to have a functionality that basically sums up uh, the amount of orders you have in your 
system now the system is split and you have to write a program absolutely. which is a totally different logic. absolutely so we can go and add much more downsides absolutely correct it's terrible this is why this is the work of an idiot right when we start that way so what you then you think about the following and say okay maybe it's a smarter idea instead of coming up with a single vm that i'm replicating over and over again to split the application code into multiple vms so you make your structure in terms of virtual machines much more fine-grained. So you start and say, okay, I have a VM that hosts the web server with a bunch of servlets. I have a VM that hosts all the code and the middleware that I need to run my cloud management, my content management, and so on. And I need to do something special. At the sudden, I use an aspect of infrastructure as a service that is called data as a service. So you move out the data out of the virtual machine and put it into the local storage, the local, uh, into the distributed storage that is available in the cloud. Right? But this is an extra effort. It requires effort to push storage out. You set up your database system completely different than before. So at the sudden, so now um, uh, you pay. So this solves the problem with license fees because when you now need to scale because the people like your account management but they only only a few of them use uh, content management a few of them use the other stuff you only need to replicate this machine that means that uh, you don't need to pay the uh, license fee for the .NET server and so on so what you do is if the account management functionality needs scalability you provision two of the account management virtual machines and then you avoid paying license fees for the marketing stack and for the other stacks it's a major step forward. And because you push out the storage into infrastructure as a, 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 as a service, the data can be shared. Right? So you avoid these data integrity problems. But again, the application now becomes much more fine-grained. It's not a single VM with a bunch of, bunch of virtual machines. They are somehow connected uh, and, uh, and, and so on. So you solve the license management fee problem, but now you take a look at this database system. If this is DB2 or Oracle, you have uh, two Oracles or two DB2s, you need to pay for them, but maybe the Oracle or DB2, they can really scale. You don't need uh, 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 two Oracles or two DB2s, one of the following, you push out Oracle and install it into a separate virtual machine and you go uh, to Oracle. But it gets more fine-grained, but now you are really avoiding to pay license fees for Oracle or DB2 twice. So, you are happy, your CEO is happy, you get 100 bucks in addition because you have been smart, you learned, right? But then at the sudden DB2 comes with a new version, right? Ah, shit, I need to install a new version. How can I do that? I need to back up my database first, I need to restore it, blah, 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 blah. So, it might be a smart idea to use the database, the component tree, what we had to Michael called platform as a service, that comes with the cloud itself. So the cloud infrastructure provider, they have their own database system. They manage it for you. You don't need to do uh, systems management of the database and, you don't, uh, uh, and so on. So you use the component tree. You no longer have VMs here, but you have the database management system of your choice that comes in the cloud. You have the application server that comes with the cloud. And here, for example, the content management thing is still in separate virtual machines. So it's a real fine-grained infrastructure that you have modeled, right? It's no longer a single machine. And then, because scalability, uh, you want to have automatic scalability. Automatic scalability comes with loose coupling. Some of you attended last year, where Christoph Fahey was giving you a three-hour talk on cloud patterns, and we discussed also loose coupling. And loose coupling basically means that the component at the, uh, at the sun communicate asynchronously. And asynchronous communication is based on message queuing, all in this room have the pain and need to go to my message queuing architecture. So they do know what loose coupling means, and at the sudden you need here another platform as a service, uh, yeah, message queuing. And you will state this component in order to avoid server affinity. Most of you will remember that. So this is what you basically end up with a very, very fine grained structure. It requires recoding of the application because if you do synchronous calls between the components, you need to change that based on the patterns that most of you understand, server proxy, right? So that under the cover you have a proxy that does asynchronous communication. So it must be done by this blood, sweat and tears. So it does not come for free. 
this effort to change the application so that it fits into the cloud. An application that has been built to be on-premise cannot easily cloud burst, but you must rechange it, you must recode it in order to be able to run in the cloud. And the good news is there's a bunch of best practices pattern that you can use. So talk to quick over here. So what you specified, what, 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 we, what we learned is we need to come up with a more fine-grained structure of the application, which is called in the industry a topology. Right? It has uh, nodes and links, so the neighborhood of two components are, are defined, and this is what is called in mathematics a topology, nodes and, and neighborhood relations to it. So, and we mentioned now 10 zillions of times, Tosca means topology in orchestration, specification for cloud applications, and... Uh, no, I thought it was in the cloud. Pardon? I thought it was in the cloud. Yes, absolutely. And uh, typically what people point out is, uh, well, Frank, this is a bad idea because if you know Tosca, all the important people are dying at the end. And I said, ah, it is true. So it's an opera, right? But uh, so this is a smart acronym. So and, and Tosca is a language that introduces to you uh, modeling mechanisms to define the topology. So the nodes, uh, they are called node templates, and you have edges, they are called relationship templates. You have plans that are workflows that help you to define the systems management logic to manage the topology that you have. And nodes in your topology are typed, and the types are called, no surprise, node types. And uh, the code of the operations of the node types are also there, they are called scripts. Or there can be scripts. You have the code that represents the, pop, the proper executable of the node type, or right? installables or images, and relationships are typed, and everything is called Caesar. Frank, Caesar? Caesar has been murdered. Oh, this is really a crucial, <laughs> really bad naming, right? So we have Caesar, we have Tosca, and the Caesar, so to speak, is an archive format, like you are used to. You have an EAR file or WAR file that packages every every code pieces, CSS, everything that you need for your applications together in an archive. This is, so to speak, the EAR file for cloud applications. It contains all of your application code, all your executables, all the management logic, the scripts, so the operations here, although these are classes, so to speak, the classes offer operations that only deal with the systems management. These are not business logic operations, like uh, add, an, uh, add a customer, uh, increase salary, funds transfer. No, this means back up your database, restore your database, um, acquire licenses. This is, this is systems management logic. So it looks like a class, it has properties, attributes, it has an interface, but this is not a class that we are used to when we write applications. Right? It's only, it only externalizes the management <laughs> operations. Which is why Tosca is also important in an area that I'm not going to discuss, namely the area of DevOps. DevOps is a new buzzword in industry. It's, in fact, it's old, nearly 10 years. It's a, it's a, it consists out of development and operations. DevOps is a paradigm that forces developers to sit together with system management guys to do the operations from day one on to ensure that your application can be managed. It does not only have to do, do not take care of the application first, and then you develop it for a couple of months, and then you throw it over the fence and say, here, system management guys, take sure that it can be scaled and that you can take a backup. So DevOps basically means you develop everything in a, uh, you consider everything from, from day one on. And these operations of, of, of the node type, so to speak, these are the ops operations, the development, the, the management, system management operations. So, uh, uh, Gerd pointed out that there has been uh, half a year ago a meeting in Luxembourg where we had an interoperability demo of this Tosca standard. And what they agreed on in this Tosca consortium is uh, Sugar CRM, it's an open source customer relationship management system. And this is the topology of this open source customer relationship management system. You don't need to understand it, right? But this has been modeled and has been run and deployed in each and every of the participating companies like HP, SAP, IBM, uh, Fujitsu, Siemens, and so on. And I don't want to... Sugar cream. That's why it's called sugar cream, in order to make it sweet. <laughs> yes! Oh, 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 I didn't... Oh, sugar cream, you're right. I never saw it that way. Yeah, okay, good. So, uh, 
Tosca is an XML language, right? And now we come to XML later on. Uh, it's an XML language. Here are, so to speak, the uh, uh, first order. So this is the root, this definition, and here we have a bunch of, of uh, other uh, elements. You can define your overall topology, go to service template, you can have your node types, relationship types. I don't dive deep into the details, I only show you some of the XML, right? And uh, here, for example, is an XML about the node type. So, a node type with defined inheritance. You can have a node type that is an application server, and you can derive from the application server your famous JEE server or your .NET server. And the JEE server can be uh, subtyped into WebSphere, WebLogic, and so on. So, we have inheritance here. Node types do have properties, attributes you can observe from the outside. For example, the IP address where it has been deployed. Uh, it has um, an interface, for example, an application server uh, can be installed, can, you can add uh, 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 users to it, you can deploy EJBs in your app server, and so on. This is our interfaces. And each node type has requirements. A node type requires a database. It has capabilities. I can host JEE, uh, uh, I can host EAR files and manage them. So these are requirements and capabilities. These are the capabilities. These are requirements. And uh, then there are artifact types. Artifact types are executables like uh, um, PHP scripts that do the management, like C programs uh, that represent the real executable of your application component. They can be zip files that contain all the code of your node type uh, of your node type proper. So there are artifact types. One artifact type, as I said, could be an, an, an EGB and so on. And then there are uh, artifact templates. Artifact templates basically uh, include the real code. So I'm really skipping over it. You only should have uh, heard some of the names. You have node type implementations. A node type implementation refers to the node type it implements and it refers to artifacts to point to the real code that implement the node type. That means the management behavior as well as the real executable. So the management behavior, for example, of a DB2 node type is a bunch of C programs that allow you to manage your database system. And then you have a zip file, for example, that represents the executable of DB2 program. Right? And you have relationship types. Relationship types are used to link node types together into the structure that we call topology. Right? And also, relationship types have interfaces because if you establish a relationship between two node types, the relationship needs to fiddle around the source of it as well as the target of it in order to establish a, con con a connection between an application server and a database. The relationship type needs to uh, provide operations to get the host name from somewhere and so to start the DBMS before the connection can be established and that like. And then you have plans. Plans are there to define the global management behavior. Each node type defines the local management behavior. A database management system can be started, can be stopped, can be backed up, can be, can be restored. But if you want to install an overall application, right, you first need to allocate storage, then you need to install a database management system, then you need to connect your database management system to the storage. This is what I call global management behavior. And this global management behavior is a workflow that invokes in a proper sequence the operations of the local node types in order to orchestrate the local management behavior into global management behavior. And they are defined as workflows and you specify the language that is used to specify the workflow in this attribute. You can specify BPMN 2.0, this is the current language of fashion. You can have people, right, to specify what the input message and the output message of your workflow is. Here comes the actual workflow or you point to the workflow model, to the people of BPMN file. And here you see a simple example that has been used in the interoperability demo. It's a BPMN process model at a very high level that shows you the different steps that you need in order to get the sugar CRM running. So, you have the plans. The plans uh, is a series of tasks in BPMN terminology and the tasks basically point to the different operations of the topology that you have. And each operation is implemented by an implementation artifact in some script. So, when you 
when you take your Caesar and you I think you will see some of that when, when Uwe gives his talk, when you take the Caesar and throw it into the Open Tosca environment, what Open Tosca does is it takes the scripts that come in the Caesar, it deploys the scripts in the infrastructure, and then it invokes the management plan, the build plan. And the build plan is, is executed, so the people file is executed. If I come to a task or an activity of the people file, uh, the task has been bound to an operation, and the operation is implemented by a piece of code that has been deployed before, because the first thing that the infrastructure does is it sucks out of the Caesar the uh, executables, installs it in the infrastructure, and then you can run all the workflows. And this is what I'm saying here. So, the topology, uh, so a service that is deployed in the cloud consists out of two things. It has the static behavior, the topology, it has the static definition, the topology, and the behavioral definition, which is the plan that basically says how the local systems management operations are grouped together into global systems management behavior. How is this process? So here's a very, very, sam very simple sample topology. We have some storage here, some block storage. You have a database management system here, and you have a database. So the block storage, if this is a type, I define no template. Say in my block storage, I have an operation to allocate storage. I have an operation to install the database management system, uh, and uh, uh, just ignore this operation here. So what happens is, is I first need to allocate the block storage, then I need to install the DBMS, and after that I need to invoke the attach operation of the relationship in order to associate the storage to the database management system so that I can in fact store my data there. Right? And so, some people say, oh Jesus Christ, why do I need to write this workflow management stuff? Well, I hate it. Yeah? Um, uh, I really can interpret the topology. I don't need the plan because it's absolutely clear. If I take a look at it, I, I, I read the topology from bottom to the top. Well, I do know that I first have to allocate, have to invoke this method, then I need to invoke this method, then I need to invoke this method. It's clear from the outset. I interpret the topology really from bottom to the top. This is what people call the declarative processing. The topology tells me what to do, not how to do. I want you to install this topology. Like you know with SQL, you don't tell the database system how to materialize your query, you only say what you want to get out of the database. And then the corresponding middleware interprets it, right? It reads the topology from bottom to the top, and then off we go. So the benefit is for provisioning and decommissioning, nobody needs to write plans. Right? Because I interpret this from bottom to the top. The downside is you need to have very, very precise definitions of the types and what the operations do. Right? So, because you need to know that the, this, this, this kind of relationship type, that's called block store for DBMS relationship type, is a relationship between a database system and the storage, and this, there is an attached method, and that the attached method really does the following. It makes the storage available to the database management system. Right? This is damn complicated. So some people think it's easy. I describe, I say I have a database management system, I define a node type called database management system, I have half a page of code, and everybody can interpret, can read the code and implement it. Bullshit. What we are currently doing in the Tosca TC is uh, Cisco and Huawei, two networking companies, they define what the router is. They define how to build a VPN out of routers. The note up router itself, in the meantime, has 40 pages of documentation. And they are still fighting what this attribute means, what this operation means, and so on. Extremely complicated, because these networking companies fight each other. Yeah, how do I do that? So, in simple cases, it can be done, but in most complicated more complicated cases, it just becomes very, very difficult. This is why other companies, like for G2 Siemens, they are favoring hmm, the plan stuff. They are basically saying, I get rid of this declarative processing, I define the plans, and here's the plan, for example. The plan basically said, first you need to get the storage, and you bind this task to the allocate operation. Next, I need to install the database management system by invoking the install method on the DBMS. 
Finally, I invoke the attach storage task that invokes the attach operation of this one. Here, a systems management guy needs to prescribe very fine grain what to do. Right? And so, the upside is nobody needs to define all the types because the logic, what the type means and how I script them together, is implemented in the plan. So, the knowledge, what a declarative engine needs to infer, is defined by these imperative guys in the plan. This is imperative uh, style of processing uh, um, uh, uh, topologies. And even the declarative folks say, okay, declarative processing is suitable for initial installment of my topology and for decommissioning and for some tasks like scalability and so on. You can attach policies to your topology, I don't dive into the details, and then the infrastructure can find out whether it needs to scale up or scale down the running uh, uh, application. But what about license management? User management, people that need to get access to the topology, it can't be done in a declarative manner. So declarative processing is a fine thing for let's say 80% of all cases, and thus it is important, right? but it finds its um, uh, limits if it comes to real systems management tasks. Right? So this is a summary, and I skip over it, I said everything, and you will find in the handout. So, as Gerd uh, mentioned, after the standard has been released, and we showed the interop demo, right, then OpenStack got more and more hype. More and more people found interest in, in, in OpenStack and in OpenStack, and we wanted to sell them Tosca. And what the OpenStack people are saying is, oh, XML. This is from hell. XML is the old-fashioned enterprise. It's type-safe. Right? You tie me to something. I want to have freedom. I won't want to have type safeness. I want to type all. The, I want to key in all the bullshit that I want. And XML is from hell. Ah, so we and they said it's much too complicated. Right, Tosca is 100 pages thick. Well, I even said it's much too complicated. But I want to have it simple, make it more consumable to the broader community. Right, so and this basically said, okay, we took a look at Tosca. We are still doing it. So we omit language elements that are not needed in simple cases. In simple cases, as I tried to argue before, we don't need plans. Right? If you have a very simple topology, I can read it from the bottom to the top. Why the hell do the guys need to cope with plans? So we leave out the plan element. We don't use relationship types. Yeah? Because the people only want to specify, here's my I'm an app server, I require a DBMS. I don't want to draw an edge between the, node, the app server and the DBMS. Right? I only specify requirements and capabilities. And the simple profile thus becomes declarative in nature because it has no plans. Next, making simpler sometimes means we need to extend something. So we extended Tosca with elements, and I will discuss that. You can define the input and output of a, of, of a topology, what kind of data I expected when I defined the topology, what is expected as a result of the uh, processing. Right? So we need to add elements to make it simpler for consumption by, by human beings, let me say it that way. And don't enforce XML. What we are doing is the simple profile is uh, specified in YAML. YAML means YAML ain't a markup language because they hate angular brackets, right? What you need is an indent based uh, language. So instead of, uh, of having an uh, angular bracket open, angular bracket closed, you need to count the number of indents that you do. So you start an element, then you make one, two, three indents. Right? And then you start the nested element and so on. So everybody who sees it first time loves it. If you want to pose with it, it's very easy to forget a blank. You even can't interpret what is the outcome. It's terrible. So the colleague that I'm working with, Thomas Batz here, he loves it and he was saying, you are an old guy, you need to leave and so on. Right? And now the piece and it's very easy to make uh, errors. Tim. The open Tosca people hate JSON. They are saying JSON is, they hate rectangular brackets. Right? They hate everything that has to do with, with brackets. JSON is out. So you are already old fashioned. I am very old fashioned. You are old fashioned. Young is another thing. 
But in the meantime, the open stack people, they run into debugging problems because they often forget um, uh, 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 blanks. They are about to invent something that is called a YAML uh, type, a, 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 a YAML specification. So a specification uh, to a uh, uh, YAML schema, sorry, a YAML schema. They hated XML and after one year they think, oh, a schema is not too bad and they are now writing a specification YAML schema. Like we are always laughing and saying, take a look at XSD, uh, oh, XML is wrong. Right? So, but this is, it is very, very religious. Right? And they can really fight about this random. In the meantime, I don't care. YAML is it, we basically take YAML and this is it. So, here are now sort of, here's the YAML rendering. And I, I near really have to admit it is better readable because you don't have this uh, angular brackets, right? You have a node type, right? Uh, you have the node template. Here's a node template. This has a name, uh, my server. You have, a, you have a type, and the types are the types that are defined um, uh, by OpenStack, but we rename them because we standardize them in, in Tosca to be interoperable. So we have a Tosca.notes.compute. This is a compute uh, uh, service at the end. You have properties, you have a disk size. Here's the default value 10, number of CPUs 2, memory size 7, and so on. And here's, a, here's an array. You have an, you have an um, uh, operating system architecture. It's an x86 architecture, and so on. Type is blah, blah, blah. So easy readable, much easier readable. But please know that the, that the indents are fundamental, right? And if you have one indent right, nobody can understand what it basically means. But it's okay, right? Here you have inputs. This is what we added. Each template has input data. So as input, you specify that you require a certain number of CPU. CPUs, the, this, this is an integer, and you can even specify constraints. You can only specify that you need one, two, four, or eight constraints. Here comes the node template, my server, it's a compute node, and it has a number of CPUs. And here is another Tosca extensions. You have so called intrinsic function. The intrinsic function allows you to copy values out of the input section of a template. And the number of CPUs that you specify when you throw this template uh, to the orchestration engine, right? The orchestration engine gets this function, invokes it, and copies the actual value out of the CPU's parameter into here. And you have outputs, right? Outputs, you uh, have the server IP as output, and the value of the output is a property of the my server instance of the IP address attribute that I did not specify. Right? So you have intrinsic functions that come with uh, Tosca 2.0 in the single profile. What about the brackets? <laughs> <laughs> you polluted it! Yeah. <laughs> Excellent point. No, I like it. I give you this. Cut out of it. I will send a mail in a second. I like it. No, no, I didn't see it before. I like it. So, that if, if you have requirements, I have the MySQL template. The MySQL template has a type. It is a Tosca nodes DBMS MySQL. It has properties and it has a requirement. It depends on the host that is a node template uh, with the name DB server. The DB server is another node template yeah, of type compute. It has some properties and so on. You don't establish relationship types, but you specify requirements. By, by saying, okay, I require something that should come later in the template, right, and you take care of it. Okay. Constraints, you have interfaces here, right? The MySQL node type has an interface. The interface is one interface is the lifecycle interface, and I've only shown a single operation in the configure operation, and you can even specify in the URL that points to the Caesar, to the location in the Caesar, and in and, and, and this location in the script directory will find a shell script called my own configure and so on. So interfaces can be defined. So this is here not to give you a tutorial on the simple profile, but only to show you that the stuff that you know from Tosca XML is uh, most often found in the simple uh, profile. Artifacts where you have that. So uh, declarative processing, uh, I already did this question before. So and now what we do in, in Tosca, we define a bunch of we standardize a bunch of node types and relationship, uh, a bunch of node types most often, so that you can, uh, and, and, and interfaces, so that the declarative people 
that interpret Toscan interpretively they, uh, in, 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 in a declarative manner that they can rely on no types having a certain semantics. This is also going on, right? The specification is significantly extended by coming up with a bunch of node type definition and so on, interface definition that each and everybody must implement in order to be Tosca version 2 compliant. So I skip forward. What you see here is it's a very, very high level architecture. We have a Tosca container. This is the middleware that understands. Um, uh, Tosca CSAS, right? You have a CSAR processor, you have a manager that stores the definitions uh, out of CSAR, an artifact manager that stores the code somewhere, a deployment manager that knows how to store, how to deploy the, arch the uh, artifacts, you have an instance manager that knows how to instantiate uh, the stuff, optionally you have a model interpreter, and we come to that, optionally you have a process engine, and optionally you have a uh, modeling tool. So here's, so to speak, the declarative approach when you, when you define, for example, with a tool, but you can also write a, a, a Caesar maybe based on a text editor. So the model comes into the Tosca container, it goes to the Caesar processor, the Caesar processor goes to the definition manager, and the definition manager carves out the topology definitions and so on and stores it in the, in the model repository. Next, the Caesar takes the artifacts out by the architect manager and stores the the artifacts in a certain in, in some storage location, and then the deployment manager deploys the artifacts that have been stored here, the, the artifacts of the operation, the different scripts and so on. And then it goes to the model interpreter because it's a declarative approach where the model interpreter now reads the topology from bottom to the top in order to install the topology. So if you have a, an imperative approach, right, there is no model interpreter. But the model also did contain plans, and the plans have been stored here in the plan repository. And once everything is stored, the uh, Tosca container invokes the process engine, and the process engine fe fetches the build plan, executes the build plan, and then off we go, everything is installed. And this is what we said, this is so to speak, you can read a plan, a uh, topology, from the, bot uh, from the bottom to the top, and you can generate a plan out of it. Right? And this is, in fact, worked out already in 2010, so before somebody thought even about Tosca, in a, in a thesis by one of my guys, Art Mietzner, and here is, so to speak, if you are interested in it, you will find a link on our webpage, it's a 350 PhD thesis, that basically, amongst other things, shows you how to generate out of arbitrary topologies uh, build plans. So it's quite complicated, right? These are the sub processes, and here you see that each every sub process is refined in a, yet another set of sub processes, and these sub processes are refined and so on. Right? There's a library of, of sub processes defined, and during runtime, basically, he generates all the build plans and decommission plans and automatically can deploy each and every uh, topology. Right? This is build plans. So build plan is easy. All you need is a 350 page PhD thesis to do it right, right? But what about management behavior? Yeah? Management. Can you even define management without predefining each and every step? My claim was yes, this is easy. And uh, I asked Uwe to do it over the weekend, and Uwe is writing another 350 page PhD thesis how to support the declarative interpretation of management requirements. Right? And we will hear a bit, at, uh, we'll see at, at, at the poster. So Uwe will be there at the poster and explain to you. About, uh, and by the way, and we need, in order to let Uwe have this 350-page thesis, how to do declarative management, you need another 300-PhD thesis on something that is called ETGs, Enterprise Topology Graphs, to understand what happens in one time. So, right? so it, it is easy, but you need to think about it. But if you take a look at heat, Heat is the orchestration engine, right? It's a couple of lines of code. Go to the open code, go to the website, it's open, right? And you will find the actual state, uh, what they are doing. So they are doing, it, it, it's, the code is much simpler. They don't process the stuff in the declarative manner. So I'm not doing the question So this but is, we, yeah. You're not solving a problem. Then you have a thesis uh, which is easy no. to interpret it and creates the plan for that, right? No. 
Uh, somebody uh, does the topology? Yeah, yeah. somebody is a subject matter expert, right? Absolutely. Right, and sure. that is not the easy part. That's what I'm saying. So, and this is still more, you know, this is the blood, sweat, and tears that you said, right? Yeah, but the same would be to build also the build plan, right? The, the people plan that does the, that allows the interpret the, uh, inter the installation of the software. And what this first piece does is it gets rid of the domain expert because there's no longer the need to write these build plans. But the domain expert is putting the logic there. And no, no, the domain expert no, right? needs to be no, specified. The there, no, there, if in order to manage an application in the cloud, you need to do two things. Yeah. You need to specify the structure of the application, which is the topology, right. as well as the management behavior of the application. And uh, the relationship between the notepads. Sure, this is the topology. Right. The topology. Okay. And people do that since 20 years. This is called your multi no, diagrams. You can specify it in XML in order to, to have a Tosca, you know, like You will see how easy it is. Okay. There's, there's a tool, you can model it. Okay. So what I want to say is people are used to specify topologies because this is what yeah. UML to put the deployment diagrams to yeah. Yeah. each and every time. Yeah? And what I'm saying is that, that that one half of the problems went away because you can interpret the topology easily quote unquote easily by this 350 page thesis. So it shows how you pick the one half. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. uh, no, the other yeah. half is it's really still you know that side here. And my claim is this is not so yeah. difficult. Yeah. And even there are people who are working on on doing it more declarative by specifying the requirements. So what, what you IBM can do in SEO, yeah. you basically specify an application server and do require a database management system. You don't need to specify that you have a database management system, how to establish the relationships. This is what SEO does. SEO interprets requirements. So what I want to say is there's even technology out that makes authoring of topologies much more easier than in the past when you needed to write your your multi Okay, let's You discuss. did a great job. Let's discuss. Oh, maybe I this was highly <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, and this is basically what you saw before. You have uh, OpenStack because the industry seems to converge on OpenStack. OpenStack has features that deal with virtual images, so to speak, with networking, with storage, and the overall architecture uh, uh, also deals with image management. These are the names with uh, 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 auditing, logging, and, uh, it's called here tele tele telemetry with identity management, they have a relational database, and here's the orchestration service that is called HEAT, because you need HEAT in order to get clouds, right, clouds HEAT, you don't get any, any clouds here. Um, so, summary. Summaries, uh, I try to show to you that capturing images and move them to the cloud is absolutely the wrong way, but you need to think about, to decompose, the, to, to define the finer granules within your applications. Um, um, you need to enable applications to benefit from the cloud. You need to define its topology and management behavior. We said that there are standards uh, and implementation of the standard. We will present one of the open source implementation this afternoon uh, to interpret this kind of standards. There are two fundamental projects for realizing cloud application, application orchestration, uh, the declarative and the imperative approach. And there's a lot of research opportunities in this in this space. Although I said that Uber is focused on management, a lot of problems remain there. And the other problems that just begin to be realized is what uh, Catalo said: that people start thinking about even making specification of topology more declarative than imperative as it is today. So the next part of the tutorial is: do we have a break now, or do we continue? So the next part will be Johannes giving you an overview of provisioning technology like Juju and Chef and how it all relates to Tosca. Right? We thought it's, in, it's interesting and after that we will have a total, an open Tosca deep dive into the tools that we have developed and how it can be used. Right? And in between, don't be shocked, in between we have a three hour relaxing uh, lunch break. Right? But, but first we go to Johannes. We can either have questions now or do it uh, before lunch. Yeah, one question. Uh, sure. What is the big difference uh, between OpenStack and uh, VMware? So, is it just because it's required or the other is open? Or, uh, uh, it, no, VMware is a product. And what's the name of OpenStack? Uh, no, not OpenStack. The uh, cloud, cloud, 
foundry. So it's also open source. No, no, I'm asking. Yeah, no, we have there. One is pass, one is gas. Yeah. 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 You, you, you just pick one. There are also many open source applications, so okay. open source message queuing system. Okay, but it depends. Yes. Absolutely correct. No, but also. It's also, also open source. Yes, yeah, also open source. Okay. Tough luck, you need to choose. Yeah, no, that's yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. everyone in the industry also has uh, you know, in the lab we use it quite a bit also. You in the lab you're also using open You should explain yeah. to me yeah. why you move back away. Yeah. <laughs> so I, it's a very very sensitive question. I'm uh, open discuss it with you uh, in the next break. But you have many different choices, right? Yeah. They have pros and cons, right? And, you know, Just one very quick question, maybe. To sure. Example, because it's related to the first, to the first part of the talk. Uh, these traditional applications, like cloud data applications, do you think there is a kind of a firm line where the traditional will be made traditional? And it makes no sense to move them. It is not a firm line, but there is a blurry line. Yes, there will be applications that will stay forever on premise. At least if you think about data privacy, data security, right? So there will be a, uh, this is why, why uh, the industry distinguishes between this system of records and system of engagement. But there are different development models behind it, the system of engagements that will be built on systems like Bluemix and uh, even uh, you can use cloud technology on premise, but it's on premise. You don't export your data to the outside right, because you fear to share them. There are sometimes even legal uh, restrictions to, uh, to build that. Do you think there are also technical uh, limitations which will prevent uh, traditional to move into the cloud? Apart from the privacy security, another sort of technical issues? I tend to say yes because you cannot influence the location of the different components in the cloud. Let me say different. It's very difficult in a cloud environment to really determine that components must be very close together right, in order to avoid latencies, that functions must be close to the data in order to have acceptable performance. You can do that, but it's not as easy as you do that on premise because there's existing technology. It may change over the time, but as of today, a couple of companies, or many companies, are very reluctant uh, to move their bread and butter application uh, into the cloud. Yeah. You are the man with the R in the end. Come on. <laughs> uh, so, Glenn, firstly, what are the management capabilities offered by a uh, by, uh, Costa? Uh, standard yeah. Yeah. Okay. Your so question was what are the management capabilities that have been offered by the standard? Tosca. None at all. Tosca is a language like SQL. SQL allows you to create tables, it allows you to create indexes, it allows you to do queries, but it doesn't come with a set of predefined tables. It doesn't come with a set of predefined uh, uh, queries. It's a language, it's a meta model to allow you to define the database scheme. And Tosca is a meta model that allows you to define the topology and management behavior of your application. So it does not do, although I go I'm, I'm a little bit back, it has what, uh, what the industry consortium is doing these days, that they, they define node types and relationship types and interfaces that each and every um, uh, Tosca compliant uh, implementation must support. Like for example, they have a node type database management system and it has operations like install, configure, and so on. So these are interfaces that are currently defined and they must be supported. I don't know. Sure, that's what I said. Yeah. So, uh, I said it's better to compare Tosca with Uber. Yes, it's a Uber as an, an application model with a deployment diagram, so it's much closer to Tosca than SQL. Yeah. Uh, you don't use Tosca when uh, you build some uh, system of engagements. I mean, as, as this, uh, uh, services that are uh, very open. Uh, it's 
just for simple, a simpler application. Uh, well, let me, let me show, um, so the question was get with, with many uh, fine grained applications where there is some database and some uh, application servers. You, you don't need some support servers, you can just use uh, some part uh, of the service. And, uh, so, uh, my second question was do you use Tosca to build systems of engagement or systems of. Yes, yes, yeah, no, okay. So, so you have the impression that system of engagement is always thus simple. No, they can be quite complicated. And if they are quite complicated and you, if you want to manage them, you describe them in Tosca. Right? So there is not, not, not the limit. It is wrong to say that Tosca is only there for system uh, of uh, uh, system of record versus system of engagement is absolutely wrong. So it, it's something when you get more complex, right? Then you need a modeling language like Tosca to define its management behavior and so on. But then even if you take, take a look at the, that OpenStack, they have their own language called HOT, right? And in the meantime, the simple profile is equivalent to HOT. So we are working together with the HOT, with the hot people to make the simple profile of Tosca uh, uh, not only isomorphic, but very often the names are the same. And they need it. Right, in order to create, uh, to install a database management system, take the CPUs, you just take this hot template, throw it into heat, and then heat does the processing. So it, it is wrong to assume, well, this is, it is wrong to assume that, that uh, this kind of modeling language is only there for more complex uh, applications. So I don't want to see all the other things. Okay, finally. Um, I have a question about the level of abstraction that you think is appropriate for Tosca models. Um, usually we talk about infrastructure components. Do you think it's useful to model platform or even SAS components like uh, more complex services? So I think yes, but I can't argue why. Okay. Yeah, so my gut feeling says yes, you model even platform services, middleware that communicate via VPN and so on. Right? This is what the Cisco guys are basically doing. Okay. So.